Uh, and then last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Mike Desborough, who is a consultant haematologist and uh, honorary senior lecturer uh, based at John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, who will be talking about alternative strategies to platelet transfusion. Uh, certainly um, one of his kind of main areas of, uh, of, of clinical research. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing some of the things he has to say about uh, the, the future future directions. Um, so uh, Dr. Desborough, over to you. Brilliant. Well, th th thanks very much for inviting me here. I'm, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the talks I've, uh, I've heard so far. Um, let's talk about alternatives to platelet transfusion. Um, I, I, as I go through, I do have, um, I do have a couple of um, slides from the Daily Mail. I hope that's not triggering for anyone as we go through. And what I'm going to talk about there and from this talk outline is firstly, why would we consider alternatives to platelets when we've already got platelet transfusions? Um, what is the evidence for platelets? Are there areas where perhaps we don't need them at all? And these are some of the alternatives I thought we'd go through. Thromboperitin mimetics, desmopressin and tranexamic acid, and then a few others uh, towards the end. So, I think all of us have had to go through this last year, but we've had these you know, issues for the first time for many of us with having blood shortages. And so this made the national news. And for many of us working in transfusion across, across other specialties in the hospitals, that was the first real possibility of starting to have to cancel operations because of uh, shortages of blood. And from that same article in the Daily Mail, actually, took this from the NHSBT website showing the platelet stocks back in October, where we've the aim has always been to keep, keep at least one day a stock of platelets. And you may be able to see on that uh, diagram that for both O positive and A positive platelets that there were real shortages there. And so as we've got these shortages, sometimes this is going to be a big thing deciding on what we can actually provide for our patients. So I think that's a big thing at the top of the list. I think also we've got to consider how effective platelets might actually be. Uh, when I do platelet function tests in the laboratory, they really want me to get the sample. If I take blood sample from a patient and test their platelet function, the lab want that sample within two hours because the platelets start losing their function as soon as they're taken out of the body. And certainly by four hours, they wouldn't even want to try testing it. Whereas we, of course, transfuse platelets that are five to seven days old for patients. So I've lost a lot of function by then. So there might be better measures that we could consider. And of course, there are biological products and they have some risks. There are some costs and with any blood components. OK, so we've been provided with these amber alert guidelines, in most of which are really talking about making sure that we follow the BSH guidance. But down towards the bottom of those, there are some recommendations and that for alternatives to platelet transfusion. And I'll just cut and paste them onto the next slide. So the, these are the uh, recommendations for alternatives that came out of those Amber Alert guidelines. And actually, if you skim read those, you'll see that most of those aren't really alternatives at all. They're really measures to try to um, minimise bleeding risk, but they're not necessarily replacing the platelets. So certainly things like pressing hard on areas where there might be bleeding, you know, that, that, that should be common practice. And likewise, this use of tranexamic acid for patients who are at moderate or severe loss of blood during operations, that should be standard practice anyway. So you run through these, most of these measures are really actually just about optimising haemostasis rather than necessarily directly replacing platelets. In fact, of all these, while tranexamic acid is in there as an adjunct, the only real replacement I can see at any point is desmopressin for inherited platelet function disorders or uremia. And so we don't really have a lot of really good replacements that are potentially there. And with the red alert guidelines, which we thankfully we didn't need to go to, they're almost exactly the same, with actually the only additional things being about considering postponing surgery or trying a different route if you're considering procedures like liver biopsy. And so we don't have a lot of other alternatives that come up. I think it's worth bearing in mind just how we categorise the kind of platelets that we use. Certainly in haematology, and I imagine intensive care to some extent, lots of these platelets will just be given for prophylaxis to try and prevent bleeding. That's a very common use of platelets. 
then of course we've got those trying to prevent bleeding if they have a procedure and I said for the interventional radiology talk earlier with the talk about plate that thresholds at the end and then of course we've got the patients who've got major bleeding where we're using it really as part of that hemostasis package or even in some cases to try and reverse antiplatelet drugs although I think that's quite controversial as we don't have randomized data to back that up so I picked out three trials which I think are really good ones and quite interesting ones just about platelets in the first place and their evidence. The first one, the TOPS trial, was back from 2013 and was led by Simon Stanworth from, from Oxford. And this was looking at those patients who were just having prophylaxis, those with haematological malignancies. And they were randomised to either getting platelets prophylactically whenever their platelets fell below 10 or only getting them if they were having problems with bleeding. And overall, there was a significant reduction in minor bleeding, but actually it went down from 50% to 43%. So the overwhelming majority of people who are going to bleed still bled anyway, despite getting platelets. And so although there is some benefit in giving platelets, it's relatively small in this setting. And this study, despite having 300, um, well, about 600 patients, wasn't powered to actually be able to pick up uh, reduction in severe bleeding. So there's a question over whether we truly need platelets in all settings there in the first place. The PATCH trial was quite an interesting one. This was an intracerebral hemorrhage with the people taking antiplatelet drugs. And there'd been lots of wonderful non-randomised data suggesting you were about twice as likely to survive if you got platelets than if you didn't and you're on an antiplatelet drug and bled into the brain. But this shows why we need randomised trials and why we can't just use observational data, because in the randomised data, you're actually twice as likely to die or be disabled in the event you got platelets and if you didn't. So this is certainly an area where we shouldn't be considering them. And I took this last one because it's hot off the press um, and we don't have many randomised trials before interventional procedures for patients with thrombocytopenic. But this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of weeks ago and was randomising patients to either only getting a platelet transfusion if their platelets fell below 50 or if they only fell below 10 uh, prior to central line insertion. And although they weren't having major bleeding, they were having more minor bleeding um, for the patients who weren't transfused compared to if they were. So I think overall there's a kind of mixed bag of evidence really for platelets, but lots of people continue to bleed despite having platelets and they definitely don't sort out every problem. So the alternative strategies then, I think the first are perhaps we can just make the body make more of their own platelets and so these drugs which I use commonly in clinic for people with ITP immune thrombocytopenia uh, can just stimulate platelet production from the bone marrow. There are certainly artificial drugs which I mentioned briefly at the end which might be alternatives but are very much at the research and development stage. And then I think some other ideas which are interesting. We could just accept that we've got lower platelet counts, but try and stick more of them down. So it's OK to have platelets floating through the blood vessels, but what you want is them to clump together at an area of injury and form a clot. And so normally, if you imagine this top bit, number three, being a blood vessel with the two lines there, von Willebrand factor, factor are these long strands that stick out. And as platelets go in, they stick to those areas of von Willebrand factor and plug the gap. But if we use desmopressin, then we increase the amount of von Willebrand factor that gets secreted, these long sticky strings, and potentially we can stick down a lot more platelets. And then lastly, just down at the bottom there, there's a nice little scanning electron micrograph of a blood clot. And you can see those red cells there in platelets are being held in place by a fibrin network. And so some people wonder, actually, could we just increase the amount of fibrin that's there? Could we use these factors that might promote the clotting cascade? Or could we prevent the breakdown of the fibrin using drugs like tranexamic acid? And really overall from those, I'll just talk about the desmopressin and tranexamic acid because they're cheap, they're very well known, and they're in common use. So the first thing that I was going to talk about then is the thrombopoietin mimetics. And thrombopoietin uh, receptors are on the surface of megakaryocytes, the cells that make platelets in the bone marrow. And on the left of this diagram, the, the, the receptor there is the normal receptor, and that's what thrombopoietin looks like. Thrombopoietin is made by the liver, it triggers this receptor, and it causes the megakaryocytes to proliferate and release platelets. And we've got these three potential drugs. We've got romoplostin, which sort of slots into that same slot of the receptor as 
the um, native thrombopoietin. We've also got other drugs, L-trombopag, avatrombopag, which attach to slightly different parts of the receptors. They all trigger it in slightly different ways. Uh, Romoplustum is a subcut injection. The other two are, are tablets. And they've been tried in lots of different trials now, certainly ITP, immune thrombocytopenia, which is one of the main conditions I deal with. We use all three of these drugs and they're all really highly effective, work for 85 to 90 percent of people. But they're increasingly being trialed in other conditions now. And so you see avatrombopag has been used in chronic liver disease before procedures. Um, L-trombopag has been trialed for both aplastic anemia and for hepatitis C to keep the platelet count up to allow antiviral therapy. And I think it's going to be quite interesting in particular to see these ongoing trials for patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, for instance, um, whose platelet counts have dropped because of that, and whether actually instead of them having platelets, they might um, have thrombopoietin mimetics. So those trials are all ongoing. Vesmopressin's a, a drug that's been in use since, well, it was discovered in 1967 and has been used as a prohemostatic drug since 1977. And this is um, a sort of analogue of, of vasopressin, which is a, a hormone naturally produced by the pituitary gland. And vas uh, desmopressin binds to vasopressin receptors on endothelial cells, and it stimulates the release of von Willebrand factor and factor VIII. And it's that von Willebrand factor that binds onto platelets and causes them to clump together. So you might be able to compensate for the thrombocytopenia. From this diagram, this just shows where some of the main side effects come from, because desmopressin can also cause fluid retention and hyponatremia. And because it can also release nitric oxide, it can cause vasodilation and drops in blood pressure. It's a drug that can, give it, can be given subcutaneously or intravenously. Um, for hemostasis, we don't normally give it by other routes, but there are intranasal and oral routes that are not really effective for hemostasis. It's normally given at 0.3 micrograms per kilo, and we use it a lot in hematology, particularly inherited bleeding disorders. Um, looking at patients who have got platelet dysfunction and in this meta-analysis it really was just patients undergoing cardiac surgery, there was a reduction in the risk of major bleeding or the need for transfusion for patients that got desmopressin compared to placebo. And this is a group where sometimes platelets have been given in the past. And um, we've recently completed two trials, um, the DRIVE trial, which was looking at giving desmopressin or placebo for thrombocytopenic patients for which the results are submitted and impress, and the DASH trial where we've been giving desmopressin or placebo to that same group of patients who've had an intracerebral hemorrhage and are taking antiplatelet drugs. And um, th this talk's just come a tiny bit too early in that that's going to be published in the Lancet Neurology next week and the results are under embargo. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Tranexamic acid, we've all, I'm sure we've all used from this call. Uh, and there's lots of evidence for this. There are absolutely vast trials of tranexamic acid. We know, for instance, for trauma, for postpartum hemorrhage, for surgery and for traumatic brain injury, there's a substantial improvement in mortality if we use these drugs. And there doesn't seem to be a big increased risk of adverse events. It's interesting hearing the GI hemorrhage talk earlier, because I think GI hemorrhage is different. And in the very large trial that was done in GI hemorrhage, unfortunately, there was no benefit there in terms of bleeding. And actually, there was an increased risk of both thrombotic events and seizures. So tranexamic acid, we can't be certain about in every case, but in general, it's a fantastic drug. And apart from in the setting of GI hemorrhage, we just don't tend to see side effects and we don't tend to see an increased risk of thrombotic events. But the question then comes, could it be used for thrombocytopenic patients? Um, in 2016, we did a meta-analysis looking at all the cases of thrombocytopenic patients who are getting tranexamic acid versus placebo, and actually the data was so limited we couldn't make a good recommendation. But since then, there have been two huge trials that are done, one in the United States called ATREAT and one in the United Kingdom called TREAT, and many people here may have participated in TREAT. Um, the ATREAT results, the US ones, are now published, and that's re represented in this infographic at the top. And actually, it's all rather disappointing. Um, would have thought this would have been a very effective treatment. But of the 337 patients randomised, half got placebo, half got tranexamic acid. And actually, there was no difference in the instance of clinically significant bleeding between the two arms. So although tranexamic acid is frequently put up as an alternative to platelet transfusion, 
actually, particularly for those who've got very severe thrombocytopenia, there doesn't seem to be a clinical benefit. And of course, we'll wait for the results of the TREAT trial to see if they confirm the same outcome. There are lots of other things that people try to try and reduce that risk of bleeding. And you heard earlier about things like prolonged pressure on wounds, um, correcting other coagulation defects. Sepsis is an issue. Um, platelets have a role in maintaining vascular integrity. And in sepsis, the vascular endothelium becomes more leaky. So if you can treat the sepsis promptly, you can potentially reduce the need for platelets there for bleeding. And there's also been arguments about whether correcting anemia might reduce the need for platelets, because as blood flows through a blood vessel, the red cells sort of end up in the middle as the larger cells, and they push the platelets to the outside, a process called margination. And so the idea is if you have more red cells in the centre, then your platelets are more in contact with the endothelium and will be you know, at the right place for, um, you know, in the event that there's endothelial damage or bleeding. I, I'm not certain about this in that I think it's always good to correct anemia. I think it means there's more reserves in case there are bleeding. Um, we did a meta-analysis looking at all the randomised trials of different red cell transfusion thresholds, and we didn't find any difference um, in the incidence of bleeding afterwards. So I'm not certain this necessarily prevents bleeding, but of course, correction of anemia is a good thing. And then lastly, there are all sorts of agents which have been under investigation. And some of these are moving forward through clinical trials. Some of them haven't got that much further. But the you know, this idea that perhaps we might refrigerate or cryopreserve platelets, or maybe there are you know bits of platelets that could be used, like you know using kind of powdered powdered bits of platelets that could be reconstituted, or even just the platelet membranes. And so I'd be interested to see what else comes out from this. But we don't have anything directly coming through clinical practice at the moment. The refrigerated platelets are perhaps right on the edge of this in that um, refrigerated platelets, I suppose, are a part of whole blood, which is refrigerated. Um, some people wonder if they will have a greater hemostatic efficacy than standard platelets, but this is still evolving. So my summary then is I don't want to be too nihilistic, but there aren't that many great alternatives to platelets. I think the main thing really is decisions about whether to use them or not. So the main alternative is probably not transfusing platelets and knowing in many cases, actually, the differences between transfusing and not transfusing are quite small. Uh, the thrombopoietin mimetics, that's romoplostum, avotrombopag and ltrombopag, I think are very encouraging. As I say, we use them a lot in ITP, uh, but might be used in other types of thrombocytopenia. Tranexamic acid, we're certainly not seeing a benefit there in those very low platelet counts. And desmopressin, we don't have the evidence at the moment, but we've got these trials to be coming out in the very near future, which I hope will be interesting. So I'm conscious that it's very important to try and finish promptly when you've got the last talk before lunch. So I hope that's uh, I hope that's worked out okay. <laughs>